morning, good afternoon, depending on which part of the world uh, you are connecting from. Um, I'm uh, Simone Borelli, I'm the Urban Forestry Officer at the FAO headquarters and I'll be moderating this uh, uh, fantastic event today. Now, um, as you all know, the main uh, purpose for having this gathering is basically to launch the Urban and Peri-Urban Agriculture Sourcebook that has been developed uh, by FAO uh, under the leadership of the uh, Plant and, uh, Production and Protection Division, NSP, in partnership uh, with uh, Ricolto and Ruaf and with the technical support of Ryerson University. Now, uh, this source book has been developed in uh, the framework of FAO's program of work, but also in the framework of uh, the FAO Green Cities Initiative. It has also benefited from the contributions of uh, many FAO divisions, uh, which are uh, here with us today. <laughs> so without further ado, I think we can go straight into the program. And I would like, first of all, to introduce uh, Mr. Sha Jingwan, who is a director of the uh, Plant Production and Protection Division at FAO, and who will deliver some opening remarks to set the scene for today's discussion. So, Mr. Shah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, facilitator. Distinguished guests, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you for this lunch event of the FAO Urban and the Pyro Urban Agriculture Sourcebook from production to a food system. The FAO Strategic Framework 2022-31 is focused on supporting the United Nations 2030 Agenda through four better, better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. In this context, the mission of FAO Plant Production and Protection Division, NSP, is to, is to enable the transition to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable production and protection system through optimization and minimization. FEO is proud of the work with a number of stakeholders on UPA-related program and initiative to advance our strategic framework for benefit of a citizen around the world. Today's event will introduce this important FEO publication and the present how it can support local decision maker, policy advisor, urban planner, and other stakeholders in planning and implementing urban and para-urban agricultural system. I would like to congratulate the team led by FEO and the colleague from Europe Global Partnership in Sustainable Urban agricultural and food system, and the Ricotto for co-author the source book, Rienzo University for providing technical editor guidance, and again University for collaborating to collect analysis and systematize existing experience and case study on global urban and the Pyro Urban Agricultural Initiative. I also appreciate the continuous efficient, fruitful cooperation between FEO and the partner, especially the Royal and the Ricotta on promoting resilient local food system through urban and the Pyro Urban in the global context. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, urban and the para urban agriculture plays an important role in responding to many challenges, shocks, shocks, and the stresses 
facing the urban food system. More than 70% of the global food supply is already consumed in the city, and this amount will continue to rise with the population growth and urbanization. The overall increase in food insecurity and malnutrition, rise of diet-related non-communicable disease such as obesity and diabetes are just some of the challenges affecting the urban population. At the same time, the current COVID-19 pandemic and the increases the climate emergency is forcing us to rethink how we produce, process, distribute, and consume the food. In this context, urban and para-urban agriculture is increasingly being adapted by urban and para-urban developer, promoted by a local institution to face the above-mentioned challenge. Since 1990, FEO have been working with members and partners to promote urban and para-urban agricultural through various initiatives, such as the city region food system, CRFS program, in collaboration with other organizations such as Royifa and Ricota. Urban and para-urban agriculture represents one of the FEO's work area to support the much needed agro food system transformation. In this connection, I'm very pleased to inform you that FEO and now and then NSP and is organizing the first ever global conference on sustainable plant production. This conference will take place on 2 to 4 November of this year. We will be headquartered in hybrid, in person, and also online. You are most warmly welcome to join this historical conference. It is now the time to renew the world focus on sustainable agriculture, including urban and the para-urban agriculture, and to provide useful information of this who we are interested in promoting parting, take parting in urban food production. Together, let's move towards resilient and sustainable urban food system and the greener city. I wish you all a very successful lunch events and a fruitful discussion. And thank you all. Over to you, facilitator. Thank you, Mr. Shah, for those uh, excellent welcoming remarks. I think now we have a, a better understanding of uh, what this uh, source book uh, will contain. Now, uh, unfortunately, our next uh, uh, guest could not be with us today. That would be uh, Mr. Eduardo Mansour, who's the director of the Office of Climate Change, uh, Biodiversity and the Environment. Uh, so he will, uh, he actually sent us a video in which he will introduce the FAO Green Cities Initiative and the role that urban agriculture plays uh, in this framework. So maybe uh, Isabel, you could put on the video from Mr. Mansour. Dear participants, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. It's my great pleasure to participate in the launch of the Urban and Peri-Urban Agriculture Short Book and uh, present the overall work of the FAO Green Cities Initiative. Our world is becoming more and more urbanized. Currently, about 57% of the global population lives in cities. And by 2050, this figure will increase to about 68%. Most of these new urban citizens will be in low-income countries 
especially in Africa and in Asia. A growing population implies competition for natural resources and an increasing demand for food, land, water, energy, basic services. As of today, cities around the world already consume about 70% of the global food supply, 80% of the global energy, and the urban and peri-urban areas generate about 70% of the global waste. Moreover, they account for about 70% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Urban sprawls are consuming land that could be used for agriculture, or forest, and these lands are now becoming part of the urban or the industrial development day. Deforestation, as you know, leads to the loss of biodiversity and to watershed degradation. Sometimes with very negative effects on water quality and has the risk of increasing landslides, floods, water scarcity in downstream areas. But cities are not only generating problems, they can offer solutions. Sustainable urban development can bring solutions. Relevant stakeholders, especially local governments, can take actions to ensure sustainable and resilient urban areas, collaborating to sustainable and resilient agri-food systems. It's extremely important for local governments to provide urban and peri-urban populations with access to sustainable and nutritious food and uh, green spaces while reducing food waste to meet the increasing urban demand for resources. For this reason, Paul and partners decided to launch a Green Cities Initiative and an Action Plan, and that happened during the 75th session of the UN General Assembly in 2020 in New York. The overall objective of the Green Cities Initiative is to maximize and safeguard the provision of healthy and sustainable food and ecosystem goods and services to urban and peri-urban populations. To achieve this objective, the adoption of urban circular systems, climate resilience and nature-friendly practices and technologies are very much needed. Local governments uh, could integrate urban agriculture forestry and food systems into their urban planning policy and action and involve stakeholders in the development of the innovative solutions for sustainable and resilient urban planning. Looking on to the three pillars of sustainability, the social, the economic and the environmental aspects. The Green Cities Initiative helps local governments enhance rural urban synergy improve social inclusion and equity, strengthen resilience and sustainability, and promote integrated approach to agri-food systems. Our approach to support governments, local communities, local governments, responding to global challenges such as urbanization, the climate crisis, the socioeconomic shock uh, that occurred, for example, now during the pandemic, and we do this by promoting strategies, plans, and actions that support green and climate resilience, agriculture and food systems, forestry activities uh, in an integrated manner. The Green Cities Initiative helps facilitate local dialogue so that transforming food systems and the creation of green spaces are part of the socioeconomic and environmental development considering healthcare, education, employment, rural urban linkage, land and water management, a series of benefits that come together with this approach. The Green Cities Initiative targets small, intermediate and metropolitan cities, and uh, our aim is to reach 100 cities by 2023 and 1,000 cities by 2030. The Green Cities Initiative Action Program has been formulated to define a set of actions that transform agriculture and food systems and the green spaces towards sustainability. For example, improving access to healthy food through home and community gardens, reducing our carbon footprint. Through urban forestry, cities can enhance their resilience to climate shocks and stress. 
local food production and supply chain, market access for small scale, local farmers can be promoted through sustainable public procurement for public canteen, for other consumers, for development of markets that link directly to farmers, facilitating this rural-urban interface. Through the Green Cities Initiative, the rural-urban linkage can be enhanced so the socio-economic and environmental cohesion is strengthened as well. Urban and peri-urban agriculture is uh, one of the key pillars of the Green Cities Initiative and can greatly benefit cities in various ways. For example, climate resilient local food production and short supply chains can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase urban resilience against multiple shocks. The protection of local agriculture resources, such as land and water, can reduce biodiversity loss and improve urban ecosystems. Farmers compost uh, urban organic waste can be used as uh, fertilizer and utilized in a safe and treated way, uh, including uh, for wastewater management, so that they can reduce farming inputs and promote circularity. Dear friends, dear participants, urban and peri-urban agriculture is at the center of the Green Cities Initiative action. The source book here presented can be of great help to help every one of us participate in the implementation. FAO is already supporting many cities developing urban and peri-urban agriculture uh, to make their environment greener and more resilient, to make their society more resilient and better off. Let me give you some examples. In Antananarivo, in Madagascar, a school garden program not only teaches students uh, about urban agriculture, but also provides them with nutritious food. In Kigali, in Rwanda, the municipality set up urban gardens, a gardener, gardens as the core of the Green City program to establish a sustainable food system. In Asia, in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, the city of Colombo is planning to establish an urban model farm in order to demonstrate relevant technologies such as hydroponic farming and vertical farming and to train urban dwellers as urban farmers and uh, uh, to, 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 to use this, this modern practice of urban agriculture. Cities in both global north and south need to implement urban and peri-urban agriculture initiatives at, for a greener and more sustainable and resilient uh, framework. We look forward to collaborating with you to make our cities greener, healthier places, and to live now and for the generations to come a much better environment in a well-established uh, society, living in harmony with nature. Visit the, the Power and Cities Initiative website uh, to know more about our initiatives. Enjoy the source book being launched, and I thank you very much for your uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mansour, uh, for the uh, overview of the Green Cities Initiative and really sort of showing how uh, important it is to have urban agriculture as one of the three pillars of this uh, initiative. Now, uh, before moving into the uh, source book proper, and I think uh, Mr. Mansour rightly mentioned, it's also important to understand what is going on in our member countries. And so to do that, we would like to show another video. This is from Surakarta in Indonesia. And uh, it is presented by Miss Selvi Ananda, who's the head of the family welfare program there. And she will illustrate how the uh, UPA program in Surakarta is actually uh, promoting the integration of urban agriculture into the city food system program. And Surakarta, of course, is also one of the case studies that is included in the source book. So maybe Isabella, if you could pass the second video. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Selfie Ananda, Head of Family Empowerment and Welfare Organization of Surakarta City. Family has become the key to uphold a country's future. With a family-born generation who is able to develop country into its best, family welfare must begin. 
One of the its method is by fulfilling family's basic need food. High quality of food in both nutrition and safety should be assured along with their availability in the market. We try to establish one program which hopefully able to treat community to have their land use at its best. We name the program Aku Hatinya PKK, Amalkan, Executing, Kukukan Firm, Halaman Yard, Asri Splendid, Teratur Orderly, Indah Beautiful, Nyaman Pleasant. We are working on our home yard or our surrounding environment yard by doing firm and orderly yet splendid and beautiful urban agriculture practice in a pleasant way in order to help creating and increasing family welfare. Under the supervision of Department of Food Security and Agriculture, the established local community group, women cultivation group or women agriculture group, develop vegetables and poultry, chicken and fish project. The harvest mainly consumed by local group family to decrease such stunting. On the other end, the harvest can also be sold to add income of the family group. With only 1.25% of agriculture land custody, Surakarta City facing problem in fulfilling basic food for its citizen. For this reason, Surakarta City depend much to other city or district like Sukoharjo, Boyolali, Karanganyar, Seragen, Klaten, Wonogiri, and etc. For groceries and food supply, Surakarta also played its role as a city which serves goods and necessities to other surrounding city. In order to guarantee the availability, affordability, and food safety of Surakarta city dweller, local government support the stability of food stock and price, both in traditional market and modern market. Local government have else a routine inspection in both the market and food service provider. Renowned as culinary city, Surakarta City provides food for 24 hours. Seeing from tourism and culinary point of view, the predicate of culinary city helps much to increase local people income. City Health Department in relation with food and drug supervisor continuously supervise and manage food safety being spread out in Surakarta. Another food system named Urban, Perry Urban Agriculture System has been operated smoothly to guarantee the availability of food towards Surakarta citizen. Together between health volunteers, community health center, Department of Agriculture, Food Security, and Fisheries, we initiate to strengthen food security in the community with a system of mutual cooperation. They have training for health volunteers. They also provide stimulants of vegetables, plants, and planting media, chicken and cages, ponds and catfish. They also provide supplementary feeding for toddlers, expected to strengthen the community after shock instead of additional diseases during the pandemic. By calling on all families and communities to start utilizing existing land or open space only, the community will have food supplies and help others, especially for families affected by COVID, families will malnutrition, undernutrition children, stunting toddlers, and self-quarantine families. Family resilience begins by focusing on improving the quality of its family member to become a strong people. By fostering enthusiasm and creativity, thus they can be solution to problems faced by society.
Together, we are driving awareness and increasing the production of healthy foods by maximizing the land around existing houses. Through good food security, at least it can help save the nation from the spread of COVID. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was a very uh, interesting video. It really gave us an idea of how urban agriculture can contribute at the level of a city and how it can really play an important role uh, to increase resilience, uh, particularly of the most vulnerable uh, people. Okay, I think we had a very uh, good introduction uh, all about the importance of urban agriculture in general and how it can really help uh, change the lives of people. Now, I think it's time to get into the uh, program proper and the presentation of the uh, source book. Uh, this will be done basically through an initial introduction by Guido Santini, who is the uh, program coordinator of, uh, uh, in the NSP division. Uh, this will be followed by a short round table with uh, uh, the main contributors to the publication, uh, which are basically Maki Kotaguchi, who's an agriculture officer in the same division, Charlotte Fletcher from Ricolto, Jess Halliday from Luaf, and Joe Nastro from Ryerson University. We'll introduce them better afterwards. Um, and this will be followed by a short uh, Q&A session. So please uh, do uh, include your questions in the Q&A. And then the session will be closed by an intervention on uh, the investment on commercial urban farming by a colleague, uh, uh, Jacopo Manzini from our investment center. And then uh, we'll get a final wrap up and the takeaway messages from uh, Costas uh, Stamoulis, who's a senior advisor on food systems in FAO. So, uh, without further ado, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about the UPA source book. So, Guido, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Simone. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. I hope you see the right page. Can you confirm that it's uh, the presentation mode? <laughs> yes, it's fine now, we don't go ahead. Thank you. So um, just briefly, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to, to, to thank all the contributors of this book. Uh, basically the people here at the webinar, including the people in the background. And, um, and I would like to also emphasize the, the reasons why we we, we decided to develop this publication. Uh, FAO has been uh, working on urban agriculture for decades, uh, but in recent years, there has been an increase in demand by, especially by countries and local decision makers to, uh, to promote U UPA. And, and FAO has uh, somehow felt the, the need to, to provide more guidance to countries on how to scale up UPA. There is also another aspect which is important. There is a, a lot of information available, a, a lot of um, case studies, examples all around the world with a lack of systematization. And, and this is what we, we, we thought was necessary to do. So to try to organize this information, to catalog it, to, uh, to draw lessons and, com and recommendations from, from, those, uh, from this large amount of information. And of course, also to support, to guide countries you know, on opportunities and challenges related to the design and implementation of uh, production systems, but also related planning strategies and policies in urban areas. So we also try to give some of the response, the, to respond some of the questions that we have been receiving. No? So first, starting from defining UPA, no? that there is a lot of uh, research around and, and we have also tried to define, give our definition, define also what are the benefits and the impacts of UPA to different category of people, um, the reasons to invest, you know, what is the scope to invest on, on UPA and where, you know, based on the context, you know, so uh, promoting a context specific approach, um, understanding the options, the, depending on the context, 
and the purpose. Um, what are the, the requirements and the, the enabling conditions for implementation? Who to target? And, and also, finally, what are the key policy instruments to scale up UPA? So what is UPA? You know, the, one of the first questions we try to analyze is also to define uh, UPA and to distinguish urban agriculture from urban pre-urban agriculture. And, and we decided that to, to focus on urban and pre-urban agriculture, which uh, also include the, the great potential of agriculture in the surrounding uh, areas of cities, no? uh, which is totally different from what intra-urban uh, intra agriculture is. Another aspect is to define what it is. And so it's food production, but not only food production, it's also related processes because uh, urban agriculture cannot be seen only as a standalone activity, but it should be connected to the entire supply chain and value chain. And of course, involves actors, uh, methods, institutions, economies, and all these elements have been taken into consideration, including the, the multiple function that the uh, UPA uh, plays. Defining UPA, you have to take into consideration different criteria from the location, whether it's an urban or pre urban area, uh, the typology of production, the scope and the purpose of the production. The, the, the tenure issue, the land ownership, the scale, the, 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 the household level versus the collective, the, the community level, the degree of commercialization, the, the, and the level of time dedicated to the, to the agriculture that could be uh, part-time hobby or could be a full-time professional or subsistence. And of course, the level of integration with other activities, uh, namely, for example, forestry. Um, Okay, one thing I would like to clarify from the beginning that uh, there is probably a, a, a preconception that urban agriculture can also feed the world. Okay, forget it. This is not the, the type of message we want to give. Uh, urban agriculture is, plays a, an important role, but it complements the, 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 the food coming from rural, rural areas. But in any case, uh, UPA is a reality for, for, has been a reality for many centuries and uh, i would say and there is an estimate which is now quite old that uh, urban agriculture involves about 800 million people uh, across across the globe a more recent one uh, done in 2014 uh, estimates that there are about 266 million urban households involved in crop production in developing countries and at the same time 40 to 50 percent of urban dwellers are somehow involved in activities food production activity in africa and latin america at global in terms of extent of uh, area occupied for, for food production there is an estimate of uh, the, the global farm area in, in cities is more than 60 million hectares and 60 percent of irrigated crops are developed, implemented within a radius of 20 kilometers from cities. So the proximity to cities is still a very uh, important factor. Uh, uh, analyzing all the information that we have uh, collected from the literature and from the case studies, we have defined four broad categories, typologies of agriculture, you know, based on, on the, the function, the purpose, based on the, the practices adopted, based on the typology of actors involved and so on. And we, we have an, an important category, which is home-based gardening, mainly family farming, mainly oriented to subsistence and self-consumption, self and based on low-tech low uh, options and, uh, and uh, little capital to invest. Community-based uh, uh, farming that is based on, uh, on public land involves community mainly for, for self-consumption, but also for commercial purposes. Low-tech uh, practices in general, but not necessarily. Very common in, in uh, Europe and North America, for example. Commercial farming that can also involve livestock and fisheries and can be from low-tech, small-scale to high-tech, large-scale. And finally, the, the institutional food growing, which uh, it's, a, it's a, a typology that involves uh, 
um, schools, for example, but not only schools. Uh, it's a way to involve mar marginalized uh, people and to integrate, uh, to create more social cohesion. Um, talking to the multiple scopes and benefits, I think it's important to emphasize these aspects and, and not looking at urban agriculture, urban pre-urban agriculture as only um, from a production point of view. And, and of course, these benefits uh, are the justification for, for producing in cities and surrounding areas. No? And if you look at them in detail, of course, there is a, the, the urban agriculture boost the supply of fresh produce, especially for those categories of uh, actors that, are, that don't have the, the possibility to purchase uh, um, nutritious food, uh, mainly fruits and vegetables from the markets. It optimizes the, 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 the scarce resources available in, 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 in cities and surrounding areas, like land and water. And of course, they, from a nutritional point of view, increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. It, it also promotes uh, a nutrition education when it's, uh, it's joined with the school programs and, and creates, let's say, in, improved livelihoods given the, the, the low start startup cost, especially the, in a certain technology of, uh, of urban agriculture and the short production cycles. Um, and of course, as mentioned, foster inclusion and, and social cohesion and finally contributes to the urban metabolism by reducing the, the, the losses given the, the food losses given the, the simplified and, and shortened uh, supply chains and also the, the, the reduced food miles. The book is organized uh, in, a, in different sections. We have somehow analyzed 200 global examples, six uh, in-depth case studies were developed by Ricolto and are part uh, of this publication, but also we have a, an annex uh, publication with the six case study in, 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 uh, at the full length. We have analyzed the topologies as we, we, we mentioned. We analyzed the different practices that are from production, but also from land and water use, on labor, on commercialization, and so on. We analyzed challenges in terms of uh, access to land, tenure, water, water quality, and also the actions that are uh, suggested to, to overcome these challenges you know, in terms of uh, wastewater treatment and management, land use planning, trading, credit, and so on and so forth. And finally, an important section is regarding the, the, the governance, the, the, the planning, so the cross-cutting issues. So we have really try to identify the policy instruments, the governance mechanisms to support the, the upscaling of the urban and pre-urban agriculture. So some examples, um, uh, these are examples from the case studies um, made by Ricolto. The hydroponics, for example, in, uh, in Tegucigalpa have been playing a, a, an important role for commercial farmers. Uh, these farmers, they earn more than 80% of their household income from UPA. In Dakar, for example, the micro gardens have become an important reality and they have somehow multiplied. They multiplied thanks also to the FAO support. Basically, um, Dakar also um, took part in a in a city to city cooperation program to support other cities in in West Africa, or in West and Central Africa to to promote uh, micro gardens. This was in Praia and Douala. And finally, Quito. Uh, this is an example of one of the greenhouses that is implemented in Quito within the Agropark program, which is one of the the most uh, relevant uh, and long standing program on agriculture in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America. Um, so jointly with the source book, we are also launching the FAO Urban Pre-Urban Agriculture webpage, where you could find the source book and the annex. Um, and the, the page is still under construction, but I will show you the homepage. And uh, soon we will also have the database with all the examples and cases that we have collected and we are still collecting and that are organized and filtered according to criteria like geography, typologies, practices, land use and so on. So I stop here, but I want to show you the, the main uh, 
eh, page, the UPA page. Sorry, just give me one more second and I will share my screen again. Okay, this is the home, the home page. Soon there will be uh, different sub pages with different aspects. And here you can find the publications to be downloaded and you'll find the relevant initiatives in FAO and externally. So I stop here and I'll give the floor to Simone. Thank you. We are muted. Thank you very much, Guido. That was an excellent presentation. And I, you even mentioned the word forest once. So that was, that was excellent. Um, now, I think maybe one question which from the audience, I assume is, uh, or which should be from the audience is, how can people contribute or propose case studies if they're interested? Is there a way to do that? Absolutely. Uh, I think we, we, we have set up uh, an email address where we can um, receive uh, contribution. Of course, we, we will provide a, a, some guidance on how to prepare these case studies according to certain criteria. But yes, definitely, we would appreciate contribution from, from different people. Okay, fantastic. I think that would really enrich the collection of case studies. Uh, to get, you know, sometimes you not everything is published or not everything is available online, so it's great if people can you know share yeah just one, one clarification simone yes I think this database will also have the reference to the original information so sure. it is also a repository to to facilitate the access of this information to other sources excellent fantastic okay great thank you guido so i think now we have a going to have a short uh, panel discussion as i mentioned earlier we have uh, with us four of the people that contributed to the source book and we have uh, Makiko Taguchi from the uh, same division as Guido. She's the Agriculture Office in the Plant Production and Protection Division. Then we have uh, Charlotte Fletcher, or Fletcher, I'm never sure how to pronounce it, Charlotte, so you'll forgive me. And she's the Global Program Director from uh, the Food Smart Cities in Ricolto. And then we have uh, Jess Halliday, who's the Senior Program Officer for the RUAF uh, Global Partnership. And last but not least, we have Joe Nasser, who's a lecturer and member of the Center for Studies on Food Security in uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, uh, Ryerson University. So uh, I think the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to ask you all some questions and uh, then we'll give also the audience a chance to answer, ask questions too. So maybe I will start with, with Joe. Joe, so maybe, uh, can you tell us, uh, we heard from Guido, there's a lot of different types of uh, typologies of urban agriculture and how can decision makers identify these typologies within their own uh, city or locality and what interventions are most suitable to support the development of particular types yes, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to speak here um, so there are many approaches to uh, to this uh, uh, these range from uh, GIS surveys of spaces where food is grown to ground surveys uh, in different parts of the city uh, and the surroundings to know who is involved in it and so on. Uh, but first, a good, before you do that, I mean, a good understanding of the most common types of uh, urban, urban agriculture uh, would, would help. So things such as those that are provided in um, the new source book in, your, in the first part of it. Based on this overall knowledge, it can guide to what types to look for, but also how such types vary. These are not pure models, but they are, you know, they, they vary uh, between cities, between countries, uh, and so on. So not, for instance, not all community gardens look the same, work in the same way. Or to use a different example, startup enterprises may vary from rooftop hydroponics to mushroom production in basements of buildings. So those require entirely different um, understanding and basis. So uh, based on this, based once you have this, you know, refined understanding uh, in a city, and then a close. Uh, Closer analysis can clarify the challenges 
that are faced by different actors uh, who are involved in each type of urban and their urban agriculture in different contexts. So with this um, better understanding, the most appropriate interventions can then be designed uh, to support the development and implementation of the right interventions for the right types of urban, very urban agriculture. This can then ensure that interventions go to the right people for the right uh, uh, forms of practice and don't fail in that. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I think for, particularly for reminding us that uh, every city is different, every location is different, and it's not easy to work or, let's say, use a black and white approach on uh, this type of intervention. I think it's really uh, one of the distinguishing factors of urban work is that you need to adapt to different uh, situations. So uh, maybe I can pass over to Makiko and uh, from Makiko, we heard a lot about the needs for means of production. And uh, I think it's also a matter of uh, trade-offs in, in cities. Uh, so how do you think that the guidebook or the book or the source book can help practitioners identify the most suitable production practices? And maybe you might want to focus on the issue of water, because I think that's also one of the challenges is really where does your water come from? Are you using the, the main city water supply is, you know, and how, how does that, you know, uh, work, I would say. Thank you, Simone. Um, yes, very much so. Um, and I see that some of the, the participants has asked that question about water and, and how do you deal with, with that particular issue. And I think also that's uh, another piece that um, taking after what Joe just mentioned is that it very much varies depending on where you are, um, how, uh, what kind of an environmental, uh, you know, ecological uh, area you are in and what kind of uh, water might be available. There are some uh, pro UPA programs where they have a sort of household uh, level water recycling or uh, water uh, purifying system that they could reuse some gray water or some the kitchen wastewater into uh, production, for example. And uh, there are also uh, more community level uh, water uh, purification systems that um, can be found in places, for example, like Morocco. So the book also um, really uh, showcases or, or is a collection really of all of the different typologies or examples um, that can be found. Uh, we do recognize that uh, water is uh, more and more precious all around the world. Um, as we also see climate change affecting in many uh, countries and in many places uh, facing uh, more severe, severe droughts. So I think that is something that um, is really important to think about when you start, when you want to start an urban and peri-urban agriculture project or a, a sort of initiative within your city or in your community, um, the availability of land and water are the two key elements that you really need to take into consideration first. Um, and then uh, there was another question um, that was posted by someone in terms of uh, what size of garden can feed a family of four or five. I mean, this is also some, uh, somewhat a typical question we do get um but um again that also depends very much on on your environment and as guido really pointed out it's not really um it's not going to feed everything it, at least we don't think it's going to be um something in the urban areas partly because um the land is very expensive and and very precious that it's not it's not going to feed everything but it can complement uh, mostly in, in the form of nutrition because uh, horticulture crops are more um, i think more typically grown in urban peri-urban areas uh, which can really help uh, the nutritional uh, status of a family or household so we can find uh, cases from even small as small as 10 square meters to, you know, a half a hectare, depending on what type of uh, urban agriculture one is uh, engaged in. And um, as mentioned by Guido, um, it, it can it can mean that the land is, um, is, is 
is the backyard of someone's house, or it could also be a community garden where a piece of land is made available through the community, the, the municipality um, or other um, organizations. And we also see uh, rooftop gardens. So places like Dhaka where um, land is very limited, uh, availability is limited, where they can go upwards. Um, and, and also in, in even in developed countries, we, we are seeing now um, abandoned buildings turned into urban um, farms or also underground uh, areas like in London. Is it me or is Makiko frozen? I think she's frozen. Yeah. Okay, no, okay. well, sorry about that. That's the, the risk of... <laughs> can go back to her there. later. Yeah, I think we'll go back to her later. I think she also covered most of the uh, questions she wanted to answer. So uh, while we wait for Makiko to come back, I think we'll jump uh, over to Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, um, we heard about you know the sort of practical uh, implementation of agric urban agriculture but what do you think the typical challenges are when we're looking at actually planning and designing these urban agriculture systems how, how do we overcome these let's say challenges well thank you very much simone for uh, for the question and before we start i also wanted to say that it's been a pleasure to work on this uh, source book with all the colleagues here and i also quickly wanted to acknowledge my colleagues from the the regional offices who have also put a lot of work into this um but to get back to your your question i think uh, one of the main uh, challenges is that urban and para urban agriculture often competes with other sectors such as housing infrastructure and industry for the use of, of scarce resources uh, particularly for land, for water, like Makiko just uh, just said before, uh, but also for labor. And uh, because of that, I think it's important for planners and practitioners to not only consider immediate short-term returns on investment when they are uh, exploring different uh, options uh, for, for land use, but also to, to map and take into consideration the many benefits of urban and peri-urban agriculture in relation to climate adaptation, to food security, to job creation, um, to health and well-being, uh, community building and, and resilience. Uh, I think we have to, to really take into consideration, you know, the, the, all these benefits, benefits and look at the bigger picture. Um, another challenge often is that um, practitioners sometimes fail to see urban and peri-urban agriculture as a system and approach it only from a, a production perspective. Yet, there are many uh, factors that will actually influence the long-term sustainability and adoption of UPA. For example, among these factors, we can cite um, the availability of affordable finance and services for farmers uh, who will need those services to, to, to further develop their activity, for instance. Um, there's also the existence of convenient and inclusive commercialization mechanisms for UPA producers that actually you know, uh, 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 um, taking into account the special characteristics, for example, in terms of, of production volumes. There's also this question of whether the land uh, and the water that are available uh, are suitable for safe food production. And there are also sometimes social norms that have an influence also on uh, on how UPA is implemented and who can actually benefit from it. Uh, we have seen in some countries, for example, that um, women uh, are less frequently employed for UPA tasks because of, 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 of uh, social norms and, and structures, or that uh, due to inheritance uh, norms that they actually are not inheriting land as much as men do. And so that also has an influence, of course. Um, I think limited or insecure land tenure is also a, a good example of a, of a common systemic challenge that takes its root uh, outside the realm of food production per se. Um, for example, when farmers are growing their crops uh, on, on vacant lots without permits or land titles, using, for, for instance, uh, just plots that are, that are, that are left in the, in the city, uh, they are constantly at risk of being evicted. And that, of course, has a, an influence on their motivation to invest in good agricultural practices to improve soil fertility or to prevent land erosion. And it also makes them more likely to prioritize, for example, short cycle seasonal crops, uh, which can in turn 
reduce the diversity of the crops they are producing and can also have uh, yeah, an effect on, on reducing the nutritional benefits of, of UPA. So in that sense, uh, I guess what I wanted to, to emphasize is that it's uh, very important for planners and for practitioners to, to identify and understand the impact of, of the potential constraints and enablers uh, that exist in other parts of the, the food system. And that this is also a, a key prerequisite for, for successful UPA governance. So back to you, Simone. Uh, thank you very much, Charlotte. I think that gave us an excellent overview of what the challenges are. And maybe, uh, Jess, you could tell us a little bit about what policies, governments and urban planning processes can actually create the enabling conditions to make these things happen. And I refer particularly to the issue of, I think, land tenure or let's say the long-term security is definitely one of the key challenges uh, in urban agriculture, but also in many areas you know, related to natural resource management. So maybe Jess, can you give us your views on what could be done at a higher level, shall we say? Sure, thank you, Simone. And before I start, I'd like to also acknowledge my colleague, Renee Van Wienhuizen, whose uh, contribution to the source book has been uh, very important. Um, so I'd like to start off by reiterating and building on some of Charlotte's comments that often UPA uh, competes for resources like land, water and labour, meaning that it's really important to look at the many benefits of UPA in relation to climate adaptation, food security, nutrition, health and well-being, job creation, um, community building and resilience. And I would go a step further and say that UPA projects can or really ideally should be designed with this kind of horizontal integrated governance across multiple departments or services. So that means bringing together key uh, people, technicians, directors, uh, key civil servants within these departments around the table so that they can see how UPA can contribute to their own objectives and how they might work collaboratively. Also, multi-stakeholder participation should include non-governmental stakeholders like the private sector, um, various different forms of private sector actors, um, community groups, academics, funders, and so on. Um, this is really, visual, really beneficial because it allows for a better situational analysis, brings together more heads and more perspectives for creative problem solving, and can also help mobilize more resources, financial, also human capacity, for example. Um, talking about the, the higher levels, um, cross-level collaboration can also be really helpful. And by that, I mean identifying how far policies at the national, regional and local levels are in line with each other, or identifying any ways in which the higher level national, regional policies might constrain what can be done in relation to uh, UPA, what activities are possible, or might frame precisely what can be done within cities. So going into a bit more detail on policies, um, we've talked a little bit about the challenge of limited or insecure land tenure. So the source book does contain some really good examples of ways to improve access to land for food production. Um, one good case um, on, uh, on, on access in particular is the case of La Paz in Bolivia, which adopted a new law in 2018 to allow citizens to use public land for urban agriculture on a temporary basis as long as they adhere to certain conditions regarding access and environmental stewardship. Um, and there are also some very good examples from around the world um, on um, how to um, provide more secure land tenure for um, certain groups who may not always have that security. Um, often women are excluded or um, people from lower socioeconomic groups, they are not able to own their own land often um, or they, there may be difficulties with inheritance law and so on. In terms of things like sanitation and public health, some cities like Havana, um, Nairobi, Kampala have revised their bylaws and regulations to replace colonial era sanitation standards, which were seen as really being excessive, unenforceable um, or uh, inappropriate to local conditions. And often the planning system, both in terms of the physical planning within the city, can be integral to this, but also as a means of 
integrating all of these different departments and ensuring that considerations are written into other policy areas. So integration within the planning system is really crucial, um, as well as planning instruments. So the source book contains some really good inspiration examples of some legal, economic or fiscal communications instruments as well. And these can often be mobilized together. Um, so I will leave it there and hand back to Simone, but there is a lot in there in the, in the source book really in terms of what can be done uh, on governance and policies and planning. Thank you very much, Jess. That was very enlightening, shall we say, or really raised us one level up. Uh, now maybe I have a sort of final question for the panel. And if you could do a really a one minute answer, we'll do a round. So then we have a little bit of time for uh, questions and answers from the public. And uh, please, for those who are participating, do put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat, because otherwise we might miss them. I see at least one there, but there might be more. And so please, you know, if you want an answer, <coughs> make sure it's in the Q&A. So my final question, and really we do a very quick, quick round, and maybe starting with Joe, is what is the role of UPA to transform the city region food systems and make them more resilient and sustainable in a one minute answer? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Simone. Uh, I start just by adding actually to one dimension to the two mentioned, and that's the equitable, equitable cities and region food systems. Uh, um, and maybe just to a couple of examples. Uh, one is how to enable uh, access of refugees and other displaced populations to spaces to grow food, to enable food uh, security, including sovereignty over the culturally appropriate products or one other very different example is how to ensure the access to all producers to the rest of the uh, supply chain uh, and particularly the poorest producers. So uh, for instance, how to gain access to small markets uh, to strengthen their life livelihoods. So uh, I'd add that the equitable to the resilient and sustainable, which are all of course very connected. No, thank you very much, Joe, for reminding us the importance of a, an equitable distribution of goods and services. I think that's always something we need to keep, keep in mind whenever we're looking at, at cities. So equity and, uh, of access and our accessibility. Okay, so Makiko, sorry, I think you are you back? I think we dropped off earlier. Sorry, I think you had a problem with the uh, technical thing. But are you back with us, Makiko? I can't see all the people on the screen. No, she's not back yet. Okay. So maybe Charlotte, can you give us your one minute uh, words of wisdom? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I, I do, of course, uh, agree very much with what uh, Joe has, has just said before. I think uh, if I can add anything, I would like to, to also highlight the role that urban and peri-urban agriculture can play in adapting to climate change. Um, so actually this year, 2022, the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, released its new report. And the report actually stated quite clearly that urban agriculture and forestry has been shown to reduce adaptation costs and also to contribute to flood control, sanitation, uh, landslide prevention, better management of natural resources, while at the same time uh, supporting food security, nutrition, livelihoods and, and well-being. And, and yeah, I think I think that's really critical to mention this this role uh, of UPA for, for climate adaptation. And, and maybe very quickly, I also wanted to, to, to add uh, also about uh, the talk about the potential of, of UPA to stimulate income generation, employment and also to boost the local economy. Uh, while reducing the, the food costs for, for the, the households that are actually active in, in UPA. Um, and yeah, this has actually been uh, the case, particularly for poorer households, uh, especially in Africa and in, and in Asia. And so the, this role really of, of UPA in, in promoting social inclusion uh, is, is, is uh, quite fundamental. Um, so back to you, Simone. Thank you, Charlotte, for that quick one. Anna. Once again, brownie pods from entering the word forestry at least once. <laughs> so, uh, jokes aside, I think uh, Jess, maybe you want to have a final uh, comment on this one too? 
Sure, thank you. I'm afraid I've got nothing to say about forestry. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, but uh, the building, I, I completely agree with what Joe and Charlotte have said. Um, it's a big question, actually. There are lots of different dimensions to it, but I would like to draw attention to how UPA can contribute to social cohesion and social capital. So community gardens uh, foster sharing of resources, sharing of labor, um, tools, practices, um, uh, knowledge. People who might not otherwise meet each other or have anything else in common can get to know each other, help each other out, learn from each other. And these social networks can actually be really crucial when it comes to anticipating um, and adapting to adverse events, to uh, shocks and hazards. So anticipation and adaptation are two of the key forms of resilience. So in very simple terms, if my tool shed is destroyed by a hurricane, perhaps my neighbor will let me store equipment in their shed for a while or even lend me their tools. If I can't get my crops to market because my truck um, was flooded out, maybe I can hitch a ride with someone else. Or even if my crops um, failed for whatever reason um, and I can't feed my children, then perhaps uh, my my neighbor or somebody else within the community gardens can help out until I can get back on my feet. So really this um, social cohesion, social capital for me is a, 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 an element, a benefit that we should uh, keep in mind. Thank you very much, uh, Jess. It's, in the end, it's about people and people, you know, should support each other, do support each other yeah, normally or hopefully. Okay, yes, thank you very much for, to our panel. I think it was a fantastic, uh, sorry it was very short and quick, but I think we really got some excellent insights from all our panelists. Now we have a set of uh, questions from the audience. I think I'll kind of try and pick a few and hand them out to you guys and see if you can provide an answer. I think I'll start with Guido who wanted to answer this question about the key areas uh, for research. So maybe Guido, you can answer this uh, first question for Remy about yeah. what you think the key areas for research are in the next future. No, I think uh, this is, um, thank you, Simone. This is a, a key question and uh, originally it was part of my last slide and I decided not to, to show it, but I, actually it is an area that we, it's good to, to to discuss about it. yes there are some areas that we we believe that we need to further develop one area is related more to the um, financial economic and financial dimension of uh, urban pre urban agriculture and and one of the reasons that today there is our colleague Jacob Monzini is that they are also conducting such a kind of analysis and and um, these two publications can can complement each other somehow so this is definitely a, an area for further development, and I hope that the publication from the Investment Center in FAO will also answer part of these questions. And there are, of course, uh, another key aspect is that this is not really a, a research work. It's a, it was more a, a, a stock taking of existing knowledge, no? And this, to be honest, is a never-ending exercise. And we realize that uh, there is a lot of knowledge that is still not uh, well systematized and um, and at a certain point we decided to draw a line and we could not go beyond that point because it was really a never-ending exercise so uh, there, are, there is a section in, in the book where we have highlighted some areas for for further uh, development that uh, you, you can, uh, can go through thank you Thank you, Guido. I see Makiko is back. Uh, sorry, you had some technical issues. But there's one question maybe you might want to follow up, uh, looking at the issue of water. And there's a Khadija who asks, um, how do we deal with uh, irrigating food in a secure manner? So avoiding, you know, fecal contamination or salt uh, or other, uh, let's say, uh, risks for irrigation. Thank you, um, and sorry for the technical uh, problem. And thank you for the question. I think as I was trying to uh, mention earlier, what is uh, important, uh, whether it's land, the soil you're growing your, your products uh, produce in, or the water source, it's, it's important that it, they are tested before you are uh, actually producing because of the potential contaminants uh, that one may find in urban areas. So. Um, 
any any program that is embarking on urban agriculture should have testing and then in terms of the water uh, process uh, processing the water for safety i think this is also an important thing if there are heavy metal co uh, contamination it would be uh, a bit harder uh, to purify the water but for example like i was saying earlier like kitchen uh, wastewater can be recycled through a fairly uh, simple sieve system of using uh, different um, sands and um, um, filtering system um, that can make redu uh, remove um, any um, harmful uh, contaminants in the water so um, in a community or a sort of municipal level there are uh, cities where they are um, purifying water of course yeah, you know tap water is is expensive in many places but um, for production it can be um, more focused um, not to the level of drinking water perhaps but um, uh, that would be more suitable for uh, agricultural use. So the other issue, of course, is the the um, fertilizer and uh, nu nutrition for the plants. Um, so aquaponics is another way that uh, that can really uh, use uh, the nutrients in the water that that the fish uh, provide to then be used uh, for. Um, horticultural production, for example. But again, it is important that uh, any uh, disease or um, contaminants are removed. So testing is very much recommended. And um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Makiko. Um, sorry about the technical glitch, but such is, life, such is the virtual life. Now I have another question and uh, I'm not sure, maybe Charlotte or Jess would like to take this one. Um, it's uh, Gaston asks, how do we engage communities and mobilize uh, funding for what well, he says for the Green Cities Initiative, but for the for urban agriculture in particular? So what are ways in which you feel we could uh, engage communities and mobilize resources to make this happen? I'm not sure Jess or Charlotte, you would like to... Charlotte? Jess, you can go ahead if you like. Oh. <laughs> I was going to offer you the chance to take it first. Um, okay, so in terms, I'll take finance first, I think. Um, that's, I, I think it's, it can, uh, as I was saying pre previously, um, when you're looking at how UPA can contribute to various different objectives of various different government sectors or departments or other stakeholder organizations, one way of um, unlocking finance can be to um, identify how they contribute to objectives and then see how um, these other departments and organizations might actually be able to use some of their existing budget towards UPA projects because they know it's going to contribute to what they are um, trying to achieve in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so that's one, one useful way. In terms of engaging uh, the community, um, I think that it's often through organizations that really work on the ground within particular um, uh, social groups. So existing could be uh, um, existing uh, uh, social groups um, or local NGOs, um, church groups even. Um, and really identifying what the community priorities are and how UPA can actually help contribute to those, those community priorities, what the local issues are, um, and working with the people who will be most likely to benefit. I know Charlotte has something to add. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. No, I, maybe what I wanted to, to emphasize is um, also the importance of uh, yeah collective action, if I can call it this way. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of potential in, in working together. And and, and I think when um, yeah communities of urban farmers come together in, in the form of, of, for example, farm organizations or farmer groups, cooperatives, etc. Um, I think this also gives them extra weight, extra, extra leverage uh, and, and makes it easier also for them to access 
credits to access financial services as a collective rather than as individuals. Um, and I think in terms of accessing, you know, the key resources that are that are needed, such as land, such as tools, etc. I think there's a, a lot of, of community initiatives. Uh, we've seen, for example, land databases, um, you know, or, or where, where, where uh, people who have land but do not use it can also lend it to 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 commute well, to to uh, citizens who would like to engage in urban farming. Um, we also have uh, seen tool banks, seed banks, etc. So there are different ways that communities can organize themselves. To to, um, yeah, try to, the, the, to provide the resources to their farmers to uh, to start UPA. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at this. So back to you, Simone. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. That reminds me of cases in which uh, I know of that people have given their land to develop urban food forests as a sort of you know, social uh, contribution. So I think it definitely works that way. I have a very large question here. Maybe, Joe, you want to <laughs> look at this one. The question, I mean, it's a little generic, but I think it does, um, you know, raise an issue. Because can we really talk of urban agriculture in uh, developing countries and countries that have, uh, let's say, a lack of water and other natural resources? Is it something that is it really feasible in you know difficult conditions? Uh, well, I mean, of course, there are extra challenges with every um, every. Every extra challenge uh, is a challenge for urban agriculture in general. So if you don't have water, then of course that's a, uh, that can be uh, insurmountable. But at the same time, it can be an opportunity. There can be more opportunities. So for instance, or more incentives for creative solutions, such as uh, to pick up on Matipo's earlier point about simple uh, spray water filtering system. Uh, are more likely to be made use of uh, and for investment to, to be made in, uh, into them where you have the extra challenge. I've seen those calls, for instance, in Indonesia and in Jordan and elsewhere. And so uh, there are many different techniques for dealing with lack of water. Uh, some uh, related to the sourcing, but and, um, and others relating to the techniques themselves. Uh, for instance, simplified hydroponics is an approach that has been around for several decades. Uh, so not used in many places, but uh, well established in some. And so uh, that would save a lot of water use, uh, use for per, per production. Uh, and so that's where, you know, the, the old idea of appropriate technology. So in this case, appropriate technology for arid context has many uh, approaches built into it and and uh, the solutions are there. Of course, the source book cites many examples uh, uh, related to the different uh, types of resources and their challenges, but also the type of interventions and the support needed to make those interventions feasible in the first place. I hope I have that specific. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. I think that gave a, a good sort of wrap up. And I think it was also a good way to fi finalize this panel discussion. We're right on time. I think we'll keep it at that. So I thank you. I think we have to give a big hand to the panel, which gave us a very good uh, overview and also answered some uh, challenging and difficult questions. So um, now I'd like to move on in our program and we're going to hear from Jacopo Monzini, who's a senior natural resources officer in the FAO Investment Center. And he'll tell us a little bit about uh, investing in commercial urban farming. Uh, so Jacopo, the floor is yours and I hope you'll give us a good overview of whether it is worth investing or not. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Simone. Uh, thank you, colleagues. For your time and thank you for having me. Let me start the presentation. Okay, so let me first start saying this is a study that we are doing with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, the EBRD is a bank that works mostly on a uh, few countries. These are the former Soviet Union, the Western countries, the Western Balkans, and since a couple of years, North Africa and uh, part of the uh, Middle East. Now, what I will uh, present is a very 
preliminary set of findings. It's still work in progress. The final publication should be out around December, January uh, 2023. So let's start. So our report looked at, sorry, our study looked at how uh, urban agriculture performs from an economic and financial uh, perspective. We have looked overall at urban agriculture. So we have identified through literature and experience of colleagues, especially in FAO, a number of options. Uh, and we focused the, uh, especially the financial analysis on the more advanced and complex urban farming settings, such as the rooftop, the vertical, the indoor, the various modalities of indoors, the edible worlds. But we have also looked at traditional urban farms and other um, expression of urban, uh, urban farming. As Simone said, our objective uh, is to understand the investment options for uh, commercial urban, uh, urban farming. And as Simone said, is it worth investing or uh, or not now we will go uh, very quickly through it let me first start with our sample we have uh, interviewed and i mean identified and interview over 250 large and medium farming companies in 85 countries i'm very happy to report that these are yes uh, mostly located between north america and europe but we have an in very fast growing uh, number of companies in Asia, as well as in Africa, Middle East, the Balkans. So I would say uh, all over all over the globe. And you can also see these companies and the discussions we had uh, through a number of e-dialogues that will still continue and that are uh, available on a YouTube page that I will share at the end of the presentation. We have interviewed to hand over 218 technology and input providers technology plays a crucial uh, role. We have identified over 222 universities and research centers that are currently providing either technical support or having uh, courses, classes, um, certificates, diplomas uh, related to uh, commercial, uh, I mean, traditional and commercial uh, urban, uh, urban farming. And let me highlight that this is extremely important because if we do not invest in research and development, especially in such a complex environment, then we have less chances to have successful urban agriculture businesses. We have looked at investors, all kinds of investors available. Majority, it's still uh, between ventures and uh, private investors. We have looked at retailers. Retailers are uh, more and more engaged in urban farming. Of course, the most advanced uh, expressions of urban farming, architectural studios and real develop, and, uh, sorry, and real estate developers. This is very interesting because we are seeing how urban farming, especially again, the commercial expression, but not only that one, also the community gardens, the orchards are also improving and positively affecting the way uh, new uh, constructions are designed and then uh, built. We have uh, discussed with the six largest uh, global uh, HR and uh, overall recruiting companies for agriculture to understand what is the demand in an urban farming setting and what is the needs uh, the companies requires. And we have looked and discussed with over 19 lead uh, municipalities across the globe to understand how municipalities are fostering and creating the enabling conditions for profitable commercial farms to uh, develop. Overall, what we see is that it's a very fast growing market. Only the vertical sector uh, has produced, I mean, it's worth around four, uh, four, sorry, $5.8 billion. Uh, we have a number of newcomers including public sector, mostly in Europe where municipalities are funding um, the infrastructures and uh, the uh, locations for uh, modern uh, commercial farms in urban environments. Of course, we have a number of spin-off from universities. So again, it's a sort of public funding. Uh, what it's called business angels, which is, I would not say they're angels, but let's say uh, deeply interest uh, investors, pension funds, and you name it. And basically uh, everybody is interested, including retailers and large 
uh, companies like processing companies and food distribution companies, Barilla, Danone, uh, and, and non-food related like IKEA and, uh, and others. Very interesting, we have also traditional agricultural companies that are trying to, uh, not trying, they're starting to also open, uh, let's say, peri-urban branches with high-tech um, uh, investments, so to uh, produce very uh, specific crops uh, close to uh, distributions and uh, wholesale markets. Now, what what are the main the main findings? And I think this can also answer a number of questions that have been raised. Like, for example, in terms of land tenure, the large majority, see over sixty five percent of the company, they do not own the land or the urban spaces where they produce. They rent or lease. And this is the top uh, decision, the top strategy, the one that pays uh, more. Uh, seven, over 70% work in controlled environment, uh, especially to avoid bringing into urban, having to deal into urban environment with rural, I mean, like with traditional agricultural issues. Again, over 70% do not use soil they so therefore they have very flexible uh, production and approaches of course costs are much higher and the investments the capex needed to run this kind of companies sorry this kind of uh, urban business urban farming business is much higher over 40 percent already adopt vertical uh, farming technology the remaining 60 it's mostly on traditional hydroponics and other form of controlled environment agriculture very few uh, have traditional, um, let's say, methodologies applied into, I mean, uh, like, like deployed on rooftops or other urban environments. I, I would say the number is even neglectable. They operate at least 100,000 square meter. 30% are becoming certificate, which is certified, apologies, which is a very important thing, uh, element. I mean, certified in terms of sustainability, carbon emissions, and the number of other labels. Unfortunately, none of this advanced technology uh, can be, at least for the time being in Europe, um, certified as organic, though to a certain extent they are, sometimes even more organic than, than the organics. Uh, the target is usually lo local and national uh, markets, by far very few uh, export outside the borders of the country. Very important, they, uh, there are very interesting, uh, from the positive and negative sides of the kind, uh, sustainability elements. Uh, with the most advanced urban farming technologies, we can save up to 90 and in many cases even 95% of the water needed, which makes it very relevant in context where water is, you know, it's a limiting factor or where the quality of water is uh, an issue. Uh, in, uh, in the modern commercial urban farm, we manage to produce above 70 times more fresh product per square meter, which is very important. Of course, the number of crops that can be produced is still limited to uh, a, a restricted number of, of crops, but these are very important cash crops, like leafy greens, uh, berries, uh, small fruits, herbs, and others. Uh, a negative aspect, but that is highly improving, is that they are energy intensive, therefore they, they may have and here we have to be attentive because it depends on the source of energy. They may have a high carbon footprint, but the, the trend is decreasing enormously. Only in the last five years, the demand, the average demand per square meter of production have decreased by 30% and by and applying uh, efficient in energy management um, procedures, it can be uh, further uh, decreased. Now, so all of this, tell us two uh, very important things that urban agriculture is a benefit okay the, the thing is how do we look at these benefits uh, it's very hard to have uh, a single urban farm from from our initial farmings that can provide for all type types of uh, benefits that urban farming uh, can provide we do have ecological benefits i mean i will not go through because you have in your various presentation already um, explain those but in terms of commercial farms it we have to be uh, a bit attentive uh, first because it's it's high capex so we, we need uh, we need the uh, we need money to do it uh, it's not cheap uh, from the analysis of the companies we have looked at we have seen that to be i mean that the most profitable so not 
just to be profitable, but to be among the most profitable, we need at least a million dollar investment. We need to have around an hectare uh, of production capacity uh, that this goes vertical. Eh? So it's not, it's not with, with the modern urban farm, we have to think more into 3Ds rather than, than 2Ds. Uh, and we need to focus on, uh, on premium and uh, premium markets. Of course, I would just like to uh, stress on what uh, also Guido mentioned. It really depends on the context. It really depends on the purpose of the business. And it really depends on the needs of the overall environment that fits uh, urban, uh, urban farming. Now, as I said at the beginning, the final results will be available in, uh, in a few months, December 22, January 2023. Uh, we are gonna still have a number of, uh, actually five additional e-dialogues. I'll, we will be happy to circulate among all the invitation and I'll uh, share in, as soon as we end the presentation the link to the previous one. With that, I would give back the floor to Simone and colleagues and I'll thank you all for your attention and time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacopo. I think it was, we went a little bit over time, but it was so interesting I was reluctant to, to interrupt. Uh, so, um, at this point, I think we only have our last speaker and that is uh, uh, Kostas Stamoulis, so the Senior Advisor on Food Systems and the Food Safety Division, FAO. And Kostas will help us, I think, just put a bit of order in all we have heard and really uh, give us some uh, uh, final uh, takeaway message. So Kostas, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Simone. And I thank the organizers for giving me a chance to say a few words at the end. Uh, on a topic which I was extremely skeptical for a long time. So I think maybe inviting a skeptic to give the final comments is a good thing. Uh, if I'm convinced, then everybody should be convinced. Um, let me um, I also congratulate the, the authors of this exercise, everybody that, because I think something like that was needed as an important step towards a subject where um, as I said, it's considered a niche and for a long period of time it has dropped off the, the screen. Actually, I was reading something by John Nasser the other day, which actually said that this is, that, that, that the whole topic went, um, disappeared for a period of time, but now it's coming back. And I think there are reasons for which it's coming back. Now, why was I a skeptic? Uh, first of all, th there are two fundamental reasons, and both have to do with what I've been accused of as a, as a meat and potato economics, uh, like very simple stuff. Uh, one is the whole process of economic transformation that sees the role of agriculture declining, let alone the role of agriculture in the cities, that sees urbanization and um, you know other activities taking over. And as a consequence of the transformation is, of course, the whole issue of urbanization, right? Whether that's uh, push or pull, uh, people and, and some data have been given, I think, in the beginning, and that's that's uh, that's correct. Now, what is this um, urbanization does? Well, it puts it would it puts pressure on urban resources like land and water, etc. And some of the speakers correctly referred to that. And I thought that would actually be, at the end of the day, not the death of urban farming, but the marginalization of urban farming. And I didn't have in mind what Jacopo just uh, presented, which is the vertical farming, etc. So I will refer more to the more traditional farming that uses a lot of land, etc. As a matter of fact, um, in a few weeks ago, I was in, in Kisumu in Kenya on, the, on a big conference on uh, uh, Afri cities, and one of the, uh, actually more than one of the regional directors of Kenya uh, regions, districts, he said agriculture, urban agriculture is dead. He says the property values are going so high that they will push out agriculture. It cannot, you know, the agriculture cannot compete uh, with other users of land. Uh, the opportunity cost is, is quite high. However, as, as some of the speakers uh, pointed out, and the, the, the spirit of the whole book is that it's not just about production agriculture, and there are other 
uh, benefits, let's say, that, that urban and peri-urban agriculture and the surrounding activities uh, provide. Um, so, so I think uh, this, this is, while the simplistic approach uh, or the meat and potatoes approach is correct, that is eventually, you know, there's going to be an enormous pressure on, on urban natural resources, land and water, etc. And if um, from urban settlements and housing and infrastructure and parks, etc. Um, I think um, the, the, the simple argument uh, can be countered by policy. And that's where the, the role of policy is to take into consideration the other benefits um, which the um, real estate market won't take into consideration. That's, that's, that's why you have policy, right? To correct these kinds of unaccounted for uh, benefits uh, from markets. So maybe, uh, um, maybe um, Joe, th one of the reasons then that, that um, urban agriculture fell out of favor was, was these kinds of considerations, but there are others in my view. Um, the, um, I think that um, I agree with Joe that, that, that the tide has changed and it continues to change. The linkages between urban settlements and food production and food systems around them are receiving renewed attention. The idea that urban planning, which includes transport, communications, waste management, etc., does not include food and integrate food into the planning process, it's really difficult to fathom, right? It's true, but it's 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 not well acceptable in this day and age. Also, because we have gone through um, some fundamental episodes which, which um, promote uh, the role of, of um, urban and peri-urban agriculture and food systems. So urban and peri-urban agriculture then, in my view, it should be an integral part of urban and city region food systems and should be part of the food system policies and the urban planning process. Now, COVID and I think that's one other reason is showed that careful planning of food supply sources is a must. And so it is the proximity of food supply sources to food consumption points. In general, the frequency of extreme events um, uh, that can cut off supply from, uh, uh, from, from demand points, I think it's, it's uh, something that militates for uh, proximity of the two, at least until we have other important means to face those kinds of things and to, to fend off the breaking down of, of the food value chain. So UPA can contribute to the food system resilience by diversifying alternative food sources in time of crisis and by shortening and simplifying supply chains. Now, uh, I think the change that the change of, of um, fortunes has been manifested by the attention that food has taken in the new urban agenda, but also the visibility and attention to urban and local food systems during the UN Food Systems Summit. I think it has, it has um, gotten a lot of mileage with it. Um, within um, um, the next steps, I think, is to convince that national governments, because it's not about only about horizontal integrated planning at the, at the urban level, but it's also the vertical consistency between policies at urban and local level with national policies. And so I think a big task in front of us is to convince national policymakers that there is some links here to be established, endorsed, and some institutions to be created to link the two. And within FAO, the launch of the framework for the urban food agenda, um, the, the, um, the, the under construction coalition and the Green Cities Initiative, of course, point to this direction. And our countries have taken notice, I hope. Now, I believe that the book launched in today's seminar, but also the seminar itself have a potential to strengthen the basis on which urban and local administrations can make decisions on urban agriculture um, UPA anyway, as a part of a broader food system by emphasizing the multiple roles that 
urban agriculture can play and the multiple benefits which can derive from it. And this way we can make this simple, let's say, real estate market argument a little more complicated, right? And and um, um, and, and and work on it. Now, um, so the importance of UPA it comes out clearly from today's seminar. Um, goes beyond its share in, um, in in agriculture GDP. Of course, that's not the point. It has to do directly with people's well-being. I think that's the best way to phrase this. It's not a matter of of um, shares, but it's a matter of people's well-being. How how many people? It's it's an open question. I will come to that in a minute. Um, so integrating UPA in land use and urban planning is key to ensure proper regulation and promotion of the urban and peri-urban agriculture, as well as to manage competition with other land issues, housing, commercial, etc. Et Back to the integration. Now, um, however, there are positive and negative aspects uh, of UPA and the way it is practiced, and they have to be carefully assessed. I will make four points. First of all, is what do we know really about the impacts of UPA in different settings? It's not enough to say it increases employment. When you come to making policy, impact um, evaluation is not about sui generis creation of employment, but what alternative instruments does one have with the policy resources that one puts on the table to increase employment. I'm just giving you an example, right? Because I heard about increased employment. Same thing goes for the other attributes that urban agriculture can have, like, uh, you know, mitigation of climate change, etc., etc. In my view, um, one of the tasks in front of us is to collect all this uh, impact assessments, real impact assessment, quantitative impact assessments, no matter how small are in scale, um, in, and, and create a library of this in order to be able to give strength to the credibility of the whole uh, exercise and derive some guidance for those that want to do policy. This is the kinds of things that will decide whether we want, we will scale up. It's not enough to say, you know, there's a lot of benefits with, with UPA, and so now we have to scale it up or invest in it. I think Jacopo made a good case of of a private sector activity that that will that that will be um, scaled up by private sector action, right? So, but we need some some sort of um, library of impact assessments. The second one is the issue of data. You cannot do impact assessment unless you have proper data. And I'm here talking about an organized uh, effort, a, a systematic collection of data, because some of the data that were presented even in the seminar, they're quite old and they're quite, um, I, I'm, I'm waiting to see in the book where this data coming from, but, but I think that it hasn't been, in my view, I, my my knowledge anyway, and an uh, organized connection of data on not only on UPA but also on uh, urban food systems, urban food security. Um, now there are some some efforts to do um, urban poverty estimates, and in an era of geolocalization where every picture has um, you know 500 meters around it, I think it's it's it soon be that big of an exercise, but, but we have to take charge of it. There are multiple objectives of um, that can be achieved with urban agriculture and, and limited policy instruments. That's always a crisis, right, for every policymaker. So it has to be a prioritization. What is it that you want to achieve by enacting a policy framework for supporting urban and peri-urban agriculture or urban and peri-urban food systems for that matter? And so part of the list that Jess and, uh, and uh, Charlotte uh, proposed, I would add also the prioritization. What is the process by which you pri prioritize objective and select instruments? Um, finally, um, I will give you some homework before I, I conclude. Um, I will give you the, the results of some recent work um, using geolocalized data um, for the whole world 
uh, that was done by FAO and others and published uh, for, for those that want to find it in the proceedings of the National Academies of Science. Now, I will give you some of the facts. The fact is that 94% of the global population lives in locations that are within one hour from an urban center of 20,000 people or more, right? 30% of the population of low-income countries live in peri-urban areas or small or intermediate cities. Um, intermediate and small cities provide greater catchment areas for rural populations relative to their size than larger cities, right? So catchment areas means areas that can influence through the access of those areas to services in the urban areas. Um, and finally, less than 1% of rural population lives in rural hinterland, namely more than three hours travel distance from an urban center of 20,000 inhabitants or more. What does that actually mean? It puts into question what is the definition of urban, peri-urban and rural? That is, we are looking at the continuum rather than a than a sharp distinction between rural and urban. And, and we know that for a long time, we just now that we have all this technology to geolocalize stuff, we know that um, and, and calculating travel distances, I think we know that more. Unfortunately, we don't have data to, to, to over time to say, you know, this is what was in 1960, this is what is in 1922. But I think you agree with me that those distances are just bound to be reduced, which will have implications of the food system. We will have implications for urban food systems, for urban and peri-urban agriculture. What those will be, I don't know. That's my task to find out. And if you have any ideas, please let me know. Because this is, even even design this conceptually, I think it's, it's a challenge. So with these happy thoughts, I will leave you. I thank you again for putting up with me and wish you a good weekend and congratulations for this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Up yeah. the, the floor is back to you. Thank you, Costas, and thank you for being the usual skeptic. We always, and I know you were born skeptic, but it's always good to have a bit of a, a skeptic, uh, let's say healthy skepticism. So I think with this, we will already slightly quite a bit over time, actually. So I think we will close this uh, webinar. I'd like to once again thank all the uh, speakers and panelists for an excellent discussion and some very, very interesting points. I encourage you all to uh, download the source book, uh, uh, learn more about the library agriculture, but of course, to you know, reach out to Weed and his team uh, for any interesting collaborating or even to provide uh, good case studies that you might want to share with others. So thanks again to all of you and uh, have a great weekend and enjoy uh, the summer for those who are in our hemisphere or the winter for those who are in the other. All the best and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Congratulations.